Okay, so this is the final lecture in this mini course on holomorphic Poisson structures. In the previous lecture, we spoke about some global aspects of Poisson geometry on compact complex manifolds, focusing uh, particularly on the case where the foliation was regular, so all of leaves have the same dimension. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the case where the foliation is no longer regular, so we have symplectic leaves of many different dimensions. So, to begin, um, I want to ask the kind of basic question, which is uh, which compact complex manifolds can admit non-trivial Poisson structures? So we saw some examples in the previous lecture, but uh, what can we say more generally? So I want to bring up again this corollary that came up near the end of the last lecture, uh, which was a topological constraint on the existence of regular Poisson structures. It says that if you have a complex manifold uh, X and the C plus first power of its churn class, first churn class is non-zero, then that Poisson manifold, uh, that manifold cannot possibly exhibit a regular Poisson structure whose co-rank is equal to this number C. So this is a topological obstruction to the existence of a regular Poisson structure on X, uh, which is controlled by the first churn class. So let's recall, what does the first churn class do? Well, it's a kind of measure of the curvature of the manifold X. Um, in particular, there's a notation. We say that the first churn class is positive if, um, well, what does it mean for a cohomology class to be positive? That's not really a sensible thing. It's not a number, but we could then integrate the power of that cohomology class over a closed subvariety, say y. And if we always get a positive number, then we say that this is a positive class. So this is equivalent to saying that the anti-canonical line bundle is an ample line bundle. This is a notion of positivity for the curvature. And uh, there's a big program in algebraic geometry which uh, essentially says the following, um, every algebraic variety should be built out of pieces uh, which have a definite curvature. So we could have positive curvature. Those are the so-called Fano varieties, a typical example of which would be projective space or a Grassmannian or a hypersurface of low degree in projective space. Uh, there's the case where the curvature is equal to zero. So that would be a flat manifold. Those are the so-called calabiales. We saw several examples of, examples of those in the previous lecture, such as K3 surfaces, complex tori, and these irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifolds. And then there's the opposite extreme, which are the negatively curved spaces. So those are the so-called varieties of general type, a typical example of which would be a curve of genus bigger than one. So these are the kind of fundamental building blocks from which uh, all algebraic varieties are expected to be built. Now, of course, um, a typical algebraic variety will not have a definite sign for its curvature. So for instance, if you took a product of a Fano variety, which has positive curvature and a general type variety, which has negative curvature, then you would get something which has a kind of mixed curvature is neither positive nor negative. But in any case, this kind of motivates looking at uh, the geometry of Poisson structures on each of these types of building blocks. So let's first of all dispense with the case of general type. So this is when the curvature is negative. What kind of Poisson structures can we find on a manifold of general type? Well, uh, we're looking for a section of wedge two of the tangent bundle. And wedge two of the tangent bundle is the same thing as an n minus two form with values in the anti-canonical line bundle. So remember, this is the determinant of the tangent bundle. So if I contract a n minus two form into the determinant of the tangent bundle, what I get is a bivector. Now there's a vanishing theorem, the kodaira nakano vanishing theorem, which tells us about the space of holomorphic sections of uh, forms valued in a line bundle, which has some definite sign for its curvature. And what it says in this particular case is that this space is just identically equal to zero. So there are no global holomorphic bivector fields whatsoever on a manifold of general type. Okay, so the only Poisson structure on such a space is zero. So while there are many, many, many examples of these general type manifolds, None of them admit a non-trivial Poisson structure, so I'm going to lump those all together as uh, spaces which just have the zero Poisson structure. 
And then uh, there's the Calabi-Yau case. So this is the case where the first term class is equal to zero. And here there's a fundamental structure theorem, which I alluded to in the previous lecture, the bogomolov boville decomposition theorem, which says that any uh, compact Kähler manifold with trivial first turn class has an etal cover, so a finite covering space X tilde, which decomposes as a product of a torus, an irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifold, or maybe several of them. And then some uh, calabi manifold, which cannot possibly admit a Poisson structure just by looking at its Hodge diamond. So here, what we see is, for instance, that all Poisson structures on such a manifold are automatically regular. And really, we have a decent understanding of what they can look like because we talked last time about Poisson structures on tori and these IHSMs. Although these are still quite mysterious, we have some idea what Poisson structures on these spaces can look like. So that leaves us with the remaining case, which are the Fano varieties, so the varieties with positive curvature. And here is something like the Wild West. We really don't have a very clear picture generally of what's going on. Uh, although there are many, many examples of Poisson structures on Fano varieties, which are highly non-trivial. Um, but I want to emphasize one point here, which is that since the first turn class is positive, what we can say for sure is that um, any power of that class up to the dimension of X has to be non-zero. And so in particular, there's no way that a Fano variety can admit a regular Poisson structure unless that Poisson structure is equal to zero. So if we ever find a Poisson structure on a Fano variety, we know that it's not going to be regular. So for that reason, it's it's useful to um, consider how the uh, leaves can have different dimensions throughout the space X. And so what we do is introduce an increasing sequence of closed subspaces, which are indexed by even integers, X0, X2, X4, and so on, all the way up to X. So these are going to be closed subvarieties defined by the property that X2K is the union of all the symplectic leaves whose dimension is at most 2K. The dimension of the symplectic leaves is always even, and we just consider uh, bigger and bigger symplectic leaves as we go further and further up in this filtration. So the union of the symplectic leaves that they mentioned at most 2K, well, we could equivalently say that that's the collection of all points in this manifold X, where the rank of our bivector is at most 2K. So remember the the uh, rank of the bivector exactly indicates the dimension of the symplectic leaf through that point. And this formulation is nice because, well, what do we know about uh, the rank of a matrix? We can determine it by calculating the uh, determinants of submatrices. So when the dust settles, what you see is that this locus here is exactly the zero set of a tensor, which is the k plus first exterior power of pi. So the components of this tensor are um, essentially determinants of submatrices of pi and local coordinates. So in particular, this shows us that X2K is the zero set of a section of a vector bundle. So locally, it's cut out by a collection of holomorphic functions, which means that it's a closed uh, analytic subvariety in X. And moreover, this presentation of it gives us not just the, the fact that it's a closed analytic subvariety, but it gives us preferred set of defining equations. So this is really properly defined as a subscheme. So just as an example of this, uh, this filtration of X, we can go back to the case where X is the surface. Remember then that the Poisson structure is a section of the anti-canonical line bundle. And so it vanishes on a curve Y, uh, which is the zero locus of this Poisson structure. So the filtration in this case is very simple. Generically, the Poisson structure has rank two if it's non-zero. So X2 is the entire space X. And then uh, we have this zero locus X0 sitting inside of X2. picture something like this. Here's a picture of P2, and remember the zero locus of a Poisson structure on P2 is a cubic curve. Um, so uh, in general, we can detect, first of all, that if the zero locus is not empty, then it must contain a curve. 
uh, it must be a curve or entire this, the entire space. Uh, and furthermore, we can detect that the locus is non empty by looking at the cohomology class. Um, so the fundamental class of this curve is always Poincare dual to the first churn class of X. So as soon as the first churn class is non zero, we know that this, uh, this locus X zero will be non empty and contain a curve. Um, analogous to this in higher dimensions, we could consider the case of a Poisson structure, which is generically non-degenerate, say pi. And that's equivalent to saying that the top exterior power of pi is not zero. So it's a non-zero section of the anti-canonical line bundle, but it could vanish on some hypersurface. So in this case, uh, what we can say is that generically the Poisson structure has rank uh, 2n. So that means that x is equal to x2n. All of the symplectic leaves have dimension less than or equal to 2n. And then inside this hypersurface y, which is given by the vanishing set of this section, the rank of the Poisson structure drops. It drops by at least 2. So uh, this hypersurface is a locus of symplectic leaves of dimension at most 2n minus 2. And then it would continue on in this way. So there could be symplectic leaves of lower and lower dimension, which give further um, filtration, further stratification of this hypersurface y. Um, so again, to reiterate, y is an anti-canonical divisor in x. So provided that it's non-empty, its dimension will always be bigger than 2n minus 2. So the dimension of the locus of leaves of dimension at most 2n minus 2, that locus has dimension bigger than 2n minus 2, provided that it's not empty. And again, we can detect that it's not empty just by looking at the first churn class. So that class will always be Poincaré dual to this hypersurface. Now, what can we say more generally about um, this case uh, where we look at this kind of the maximal rank of the Poisson structure and we consider the locus where it drops just below that maximal rank? So let's suppose that we now have a Poisson structure whose maximum rank throughout X is equal to 2R. So it maybe is not a symplectic structure, but anyway, we know its maximal rank is some even integer. So in other words, that's saying that the space X is equal to X to R. All of the symplectic leaves have dimension at most to R. And then we could look at the maximal degeneracy locus, which would be the place where the rank drops below to R. So that's X sub M where M is to R minus two. So now what I wanna do is consider the complement of this degeneracy locus. Let me call that U. So U is X, remove XM. That's an open set in X because XM is closed. And moreover, by definition, it carries a regular Poisson structure. So the rank of the Poisson structure is equal to 2R throughout U. And so the co-rank C is the dimension of X minus 2R. So uh, with this notation in hand, I want to uh, give a proposition which tells us what the dimension of this maximal degeneracy locus has to be. So let's suppose again that we have the Poisson structure whose maximal rank is 2R, um, and we write the co-rank in this way, C is dimension of X minus 2R. And let's suppose that the C plus first power of the first churn class is non-zero. And what I claim is that the dimension of this locus xm is always bigger than m. So to see this, we're going to use this uh, topological obstruction to the existence of regular Poisson structures in the following way. So uh, we have this locus xm. We're trying to show that its dimension is large. In other words, we're trying to show that its co-dimension is small. So let's let c prime be the co-dimension. What we need to show is that C prime is no bigger than C plus one. Now the trick is to uh, use what we know about regular Poisson structures um, in terms of their first churn class and relate that information to the information about the first churn class of X. So let's consider now the restriction map, which takes a cohomology class on X and restricts it to get a cohomology class on U. So it's the pullback along the inclusion. Well, uh, U is the complement of a closed subset, and some basic cohomology theory will show you that uh, 
this restriction map will give an isomorphism or even be injective, um, provided that the co-dimension of that uh, locus that you're removing is bigger than the degree that you're looking at in cohomology. So the restriction map from H2J to H2JU is injective, provided that J is less than the co-dimension C prime. On the other hand, um, if you take the first churn class of X, well, that's the first churn class of the anti-canonical line bundle, and that will restrict to the first churn class of U. So this restriction map on cohomology takes the, the power of the first churn class of X to the power of the first churn class of U. And since U can, supports a regular Poisson structure of co-rank C, our topological obstruction tells us that this class here must vanish when J is bigger than C. So now we have two things which are fundamentally in tension. We have an injective map on cohomology when J is less than C prime. On the other hand, we have a class on X, which we know is non-zero, which maps to a zero class on U. So the only way that we can resolve this tension is if um, this number J is uh, equal to C, sorry, so if so first of all j has to be between c and c prime and if that's the case then we would conclude that the first turn class of x raised to the power of j was equal to zero because in that case this map would be injective but this class would map to zero okay. on the other hand we know by assumption that the c plus first power of the first turn class is non-zero that's an assumption in our proposition so uh, that's only possible provided that this bound is satisfied. So C prime is less than or equal to C plus one. Okay. So provided that this class is non-zero, then the, the kind of maximal degeneracy locus XM, it always has dimension bigger than M. So um, Bondal, Alexei Bondal was aware of this uh, calculation and some, some further examples. And he made an interesting conjecture about these degeneracy lo loci for Fano varieties. So let's suppose that we have a Fano variety X whose dimension is equal to N. So remember in particular that that implies that all of the powers of the first churn class up to N are non-zero. In light of the proposition before, we kind of expect this to give some lower bound on the dimension of the degeneracy locus. And so what he conjectured was the following. Suppose that you have X a Fano variety and consider an uh, even integer 2r, which is less than the dimension of x. Then this degeneracy locus, x2r, where the symplectic leaves have dimension at most 2r, this, uh, this is a closed subvariety, and the conjecture is that it has an irreducible component of dimension bigger than 2r. So roughly speaking, you could Think of this as saying that uh, if you look at the symplectic leaves of dimension 2r, then they always come in a family with at least one parameter. Um, that's not quite an accurate description, but the way to think about it is that there are lots of symplectic leaves of small dimension. So um, just to uh, illustrate this, um, it's useful to compare what Bondal is conjecturing with what you might naively guess by just counting the number of equations which cut out these loci. So let's look in particular at the zero locus of the Poisson structure, that's x zero, and uh, see how that uh, would uh, change as a function of the dimension of x. So the dimension of x is what we're calling n, and if you wanted to get a naive estimate of the dimension of the zero locus, what you should do is um, count the number of equations which you need to cut it out. Well, in local coordinates, uh, we're looking at the vanishing of the, the Poisson brackets. Um, if there are, the dimension is n, then there are n coordinates. And since the bracket is skew symmetric, there are n choose two brackets of coordinate functions which you can consider. So you would naively expect that uh, the dimension of this locus x0 is the number of coordinates minus the number of equations, so n minus n choose 2. And on the other hand, there's uh, this uh, bound, which is given to us by Mondel. So let's compare these. Well, if n is equal to 0, then everything inside is just a point. So uh, the naive estimate and Bondal, they both say that the locus will have dimension 0. 
if the dimension of x is equal to 1, then there are no bivectors whatsoever. The only bivector is 0. So again, um, the 0 locus of the bivector is the whole space, and so everything has dimension 1. In dimension 2, now we're looking at a surface, and as we saw on a surface, the Poisson structure will vanish on a curve if it's non-empty. And um, again, that's what Bondal says. He always says that the dimension of the 0 locus will be bigger than zero, so it's always at least one. Uh, if we look at a threefold, then now we have three coordinates and three uh, independent Poisson brackets which have to vanish, so we would expect now that the zero locus is a collection of uh, isolated points, but Bondal again says that this locus is always bigger than zero dimensional. So it must contain a curve. Uh, in dimension four, now we have four coordinates and four choose two is six equations. So the expected dimension of this locus, if you just naively count, would be minus two, which would mean that we don't expect the, there to be any zeros of the Poisson structure. But nevertheless, Bondal again says that this locus should contain a curve. And this effect just gets uh, more and more pronounced in higher dimension. So the further the dimension increases, the bigger this number n choose 2 gets, and the more and more negative the expected dimension would be. But Bondal always predicts that there will be a curve in the zero locus of the Poisson structure. Um, now, the point here is that these, uh, these bounds, which you get from naively counting equations, those typically only work when you have a generic section of some vector bundle. And in our case, we are very far from having a generic section. Our bivector satisfies this uh, integrability condition that its scouting bracket with itself is equal to zero. That's a, a highly nonlinear PDE. Um, so there's no sense in which we're looking at a generic section. So that kind of explains the tension between what Bondal predicts and, and what this naive estimate would, would suggest. So um, this conjecture is, is still open, but it's been proven in some cases. Um, so first of all, as we saw above, for points and curves, this is a trivial statement. For surfaces, um, this boils down to the fact that the first churn class of a Fano surface is non-zero. So that we took care of in a previous slide. Uh, for threefolds, while now we're in a situation where the rank of the Poisson structure is always even, and it can never be bigger than the dimension of the manifold, so that means that the rank is either zero or two everywhere. If it's zero, there's nothing to say. Uh, if the rank is two generically, then we can apply our previous proposition to uh, conclude that the zero locus contains a curve, because that will be the, the maximal degeneracy locus. Uh, and then for fourfolds, um, this conjecture is also known. That was a result of myself and Gualtieri in 2013. Um, the proof is rather more involved, and it makes explicit use of this uh, modular vector field, which remembers the kind of divergence of the Poisson tensor in local coordinates. So I'm not going to have time to go through the details of the argument, but let me just try to sketch the, the main ideas here. So. Um, First of all, if the maximal rank of the Poisson structure is equal to 2 everywhere, then again we can apply the previous proposition, the zero locus is this, the maximal degeneracy locus, and Bondal's conjecture will follow from that. So the interesting case is now when the rank is not generically 2, but is generically 4. So that's the case where the Poisson structure is generically non-degenerate, and as we saw in the previous slides, um, that means that it will degenerate along an anti-canonical divisor, which will be our locus x2. So that's the maximal degeneracy locus, and that will always be non-empty of dimension 3. And what we need to do now is show that the zero locus of this Poisson structure contains a curve. So you say, well, okay, we know that the conjecture holds for threefolds. Uh, here I have a threefold. Why don't I just proceed by induction? The problem is that this anti-canonical divisor is not a Fano variety, it's a Calabi-Yau. And so the conjecture doesn't apply to it. 
So what we somehow need to do is make use of the uh, ambient anti-canonical line bundle rather than that of Y. And so the idea is to use Bot's vanishing theorem applied to the anti-canonical line bundle of X rather than Y to continue the argument. Uh, so for that, what you need to argue is that inside Y, the uh, anti-canonical bundle of X carries a flat connection along the symplectic leaves. Um, put differently, this is essentially saying that uh, there would be an ambient anti-canonical volume form, uh, which is invariant under Hamiltonian flows in Y. But as we've seen, there's an obstruction to the existence of such a volume form, which is this modular vector field. And so the problem is that inside this locus Y, the modular vector field is transverse to the symplectic leaves, and that obstructs the existence of a Hamiltonian invariant volume form. So what we realized is that if you look at the singular locus of this uh, threefold, then first of all, we could prove that the singular locus was always non-empty and give a bound on its co-dimension. And uh, furthermore, we could show that this obstruction to applying Bott's vanishing theorem, it actually vanishes inside the singular locus of Y. So once you pass to the singular locus, you can run our uh, argument to get a constraint relating the first turn class of X and uh, the rank of the Poisson tensor. So ultimately, this uh, this argument is still based on the use of Bott's vanishing theorem, but the key realization was that the, that uh, that theorem is somehow obstructed uh, unless you're quite careful about the geometry of this modular vector field. Okay, so the, the conjecture is known then up to dimension four. Uh, and beyond that, there are some, some partial results, but I don't think that there have been any cases where it's been proven for five folds, for instance. So it's still an open problem. So this conjecture is somehow uh, one of the main um, structural uh, facts or suggestions about Poisson Fano varieties. Um, so now that we've talked about that, I'd like to turn a little bit to the classification of Poisson Fano varieties. So for that, we should start again with the case of surfaces. So um, the surfaces that are Fano uh, have a name, they're called the Del Pezzo surfaces. And um, they have various invariants. One of them is called the degree, which is the integral of C1 squared over X. So um, this of course is always a positive number on a Fano variety by definition. And you can calculate various other uh, properties of the Fano variety uh, of the Depazzo surface in terms of its degree. So for instance, the second Betty number, the rank of the second homology is uh, 10 minus the degree. And since the second Betty number of a projective manifold is always uh, positive, this tells us that the degree can never be bigger than 10, or can never be uh, bigger than nine rather. Okay, so the degree of the Del Pezzo surface is a number somewhere between one and nine. Um, in, in fact, it's completely understood what all these surfaces look like. So here's a rough diagram. So the maximal possible degree is nine and the only Del Pezzo surface with that degree is the projective plane P2. We've already seen now many times what a Poisson structure on P2 looks like. It's uh, generically symplectic and it vanishes along a cubic curve. Uh, in degree eight, there are two possibilities. Uh, the simplest one is uh, the product of two copies of the projective line, P1 cross P1. And it's straightforward to give a similar description of what a Poisson structure can look like on this surface. It's a divisor of by degree two, two. And the only other Del Pezzo degree eight is the so-called first Hertzebrook surface, which is um, a non-trivial P1 bundle over P1. And you can also get the first Hertzebrook surface by taking P2 and blowing up a point. So remember, that's a kind of surgery which takes a point in P2 and replaces it with a copy of the projected line. And in fact, all the other Del Pezzo surfaces of degree seven all the way down to one, they're given by this operation of blowing up. So I, I start with a Del Pezzo surface of some degree. I choose a point in it. I blow it up. I get a Del Pezzo surface of degree one less. And this continues until I get the degree down to one. <clears throat> 
And so in that way, what we can do is uh, reduce the classification of Poisson structures on Del Pezzo surfaces just to understanding what goes on with these kind of maximal degree cases, which are not blow up of anything else. And in order to do that, one makes use of a lemma, which explains what happens when you blow up a point in a Poisson surface. So it says the following, let's suppose that we have a surface X primed, which can be obtained by blowing up some other surface X at a point. Then the collection of Poisson structures on X primed is exactly the set of Poisson structures on X that vanish at this point. So for instance, I take uh, P2, I choose a point on the zero locus of the Poisson structure, I blow it up, and then I'll get a Poisson structure on this uh, first Hertzebrook surface. And conversely, any Poisson structure on the, this uh, surface, this Hertzebrook surface, arises from that construction. So I take a cubic curve and I blow up a point on that curve. Okay, so in that way, we get a complete uh, understanding of what all the Poisson structures on Del Pezzo surfaces can look like. It all boils down to P2 and P1 cross P1. So maybe we should talk about some higher dimensional examples. So here is one way of constructing um, higher dimensional Poisson structures, which is uh, using Del Pezzo's. So let's imagine now that we have a fibration whose fibers are Del Pezzo surfaces. Um, and we can consider the relative anti-canonical line bundle. So that's the line bundle on X that corresponds to the anti-canonical of the fibers. So that's uh, the anti-canonical of X tensored the pullback of the canonical of Z by the adjunction formula. Um, so now imagine that we could find a non-zero section of this line bundle. Then it would mean that on each fiber, I had a section of the anti-canonical line bundle. So I would have a Poisson surface. And in this way, what I would get is a Poisson structure, uh, which had generically rank two, uh, and the symplectic leaves were con contained in the fibers of this map F. So you could think of uh, symplectic leaves as having the closure, which is these Del Pezzo surfaces that are the fibers. <laughs> so a nice example of this, uh, quite a famous example due to Sklanen from 1982, is to take a pencil of quadrics in P3 so you start with P3 and you consider a rational map to a P1, which is given by a pair of homogeneous quadratic polynomials in homogeneous coordinates for P3. Uh, so what are the fibers of this map? Well, uh, uh, F inverse of S colon T, um, that's saying that Q0 divided by Q1 is equal to S over T or equivalently T Q zero minus S Q one is equal to zero. So this is defining a quadric surface in P three, and at least when it's smooth, this will be a copy of P one cross P one, so a Del Pezzo surface. And we can co compute the anti-canonical line bundle uh, fairly easily. So the relative anti-canonical is the anti-canonical of P three, which is O four, times the pullback of the canonical of P one, which is O minus two. But F is a map of degree two, so the pullback of O minus two is O minus four, and these two cancel to give the trivial bundle. So this uh, relative anti-canonical bundle carries a unique section up to rescaling. And we get a Poisson structure which has the following form. So this is a rational map. It actually fails to be defined at the common zero locus of these two quadratic polynomials. Well, the intersection of two generic quadrics in P3 is an elliptic curve. Uh, and that's a irreducible component of the zero locus of this Poisson structure. So there's our one dimensional component of the zero locus that was predicted by Von Dahl. Uh, but then um, there could be uh, other points where the Poisson structure vanishes. In fact, there are four other points generically. Um, so in a pencil of quadrics, there will be going to be four surfaces which are singular at an isolated singular point, and those four isolated singular points are zero points where the Poisson structure vanishes, and they're, they're a copy locally of the origin in the SL2 Lie algebra. That's what the Poisson structure looks like. So here we get a family of quadric surfaces, which are uh, the symplectic leaves uh, intersecting along this elliptic curve and with these four additional points. <clears throat> 
And so there are lots of other ways of constructing Poisson structures in higher dimensions. So there's a generalization of blowing up and down points on surfaces, which was explained by Polishchuk. There are various constructions where you take differential forms with poles on an anti-canonical divisor in Fano. So um, there's the notion of a log symplectic form. This is where you have an open, dense symplectic leaf. Uh, and the symplectic form has poles along an anti-canonical divisor. Um, there's a similar construction where instead of taking a two form, you take an n minus two form and you can contract it into an anti-canonical section to get a bivector like we talked about previously. And uh, that will give a Poisson structure of generic rank two. There are various constructions involving projective bundles. So you could take a P1 bundle over some Poisson manifold and there's a procedure for lifting the Poisson structure on that uh, base to the total space, which was described by Polishchuk, which makes use of some analog of a flat connection, not quite the same thing. Uh, there's an interesting study in a uh, forthcoming thesis of uh, Mikola Matvichuk, uh, uh, projective bundles with fibers of higher dimension, uh, which project to the zero Poisson manifold. Um, and these are closely related to some objects from mathematical physics called Cohigs fields. And there are various Lie theoretic constructions, which have been studied very nicely, in particular in the works of Xianghua Lu and her collaborators. Um, so Poisson structures on flag manifolds and Bot Samuelson varieties and lots of different constructions. One of the key ideas here is that when you have a group that is acting on a variety X, there's a way to take an element in wedge two of the Lie algebra satisfying a suitable equation and push it forward to get a Poisson structure using the infinitesimal action of the Lie algebra in X. And for me, maybe the most compelling source of examples are various moduli spaces coming from uh, algebraic geometry and mathematical physics. So generalizing that uh, Sklianen Poisson structure, which we saw in P3, there's a huge collection of Poisson structures associated with elliptic curves, which was discovered by Fagan and Odesky. These are um, Poisson structures on uh, projective spaces of all possible dimension, quite interesting. But other, uh, many other interesting moduli spaces carry Poisson structures, so moduli spaces of monopoles, Higgs bundles, sheaves on Poisson surfaces. So here gives us, uh, this gives us many uh, very, quite compelling examples of Poisson structures on varieties which are Fano or quite close to Fano. So there are lots and lots of examples of these uh, Poisson Fano varieties, and so if we want to talk about the classification, it maybe doesn't make sense to just give a list of all the possible isomorphism classes. It makes better sense to parameterize them by a moduli space. So we have a moduli space of Poisson varieties, which parameterizes all possible pairs of X and Pi up to isomorphism. And this uh, decomposes as a union of irreducible components, which correspond to qualitatively different families of Poisson varieties. So for instance, there's an irreducible component of the moduli space, which corresponds to all the Poisson structures on P2. Well, as we've seen, a Poisson structure on P2 is a section of the anticanonical line bundle. So that's an element in H0 of O3. That's a finite dimensional vector space. And, uh, and then we have to consider when two such things are isomorphic. Well, that's uh, when they differ by a projective transformation. So this component of the moduli space is the quotient of this vector space by a natural action of the group PGL3. In particular, it's irreducible. We could ask also about higher dimensional projective spaces. Um, so here, perhaps the most striking result is um, a theorem of Cervaux and Lisnetto, which was classifying certain foliations and then was extended by Leray, Pereira, and Touze. It says that the moduli space of Poisson structures on P3 has six irreducible components, so more than one. Uh, and there are some similar results for uh, other Fano varieties with second Betty number equal to one. So it's not just that this uh, space has six irreducible components. We have a very good understanding of what the Poisson structure is corresponding to these different irreducible co components of the moduli space look like. So there are a couple of components. Here I'm drawing the symplectic leaves of the Poisson structures in these components. There are a couple of components which have leaves which are not algebraic. So the generic leaves of these Poisson structures are dense in P3. Those are defined by closed uh, one forms. Uh, and then there's this Sklanen Poisson structure associated with a pencil of quadrics, which we saw in the previous slide. 
And there's another family which is associated with a pencil of cubic surfaces that contains a plane. And that one also vanishes on an elliptic curve, but it's an elliptic curve which sits inside this plane. Uh, there are some examples which have a Lie theoretic origin. So there's an example which you get from an action of PGL2. And there are some examples which you get from kind of uh, thinking of P3 as birationally equivalent to a P1 bundle over P2 and lifting the Poisson structure from P2. So, so each of the uh, six components, it corresponds to a very uh, well understood family of Poisson structures on P3. Um, beyond that result, there isn't a whole lot definitively that we can say about the classification. So um, for Betty number bigger than one, I, I think it still hasn't been completely described. Um, and in dimension bigger than three, certainly uh, it's, it's very much unclear what the picture should be. Um, although there are some several examples now of different irreducible components of this moduli space. Um, so let me close by just offering uh, one forthcoming result, which um, continues this sequence looking at the projective spaces. So what we are able to prove is that the moduli space of Poisson structures on P4 has a lot of components. So um, there are already around 40 components which correspond to Poisson structures that admit a generically symplectic toric degeneration. So the way that we prove this is to look at some Poisson structures which have a high degree of symmetry, the toric ones, and see which ways we can possibly deform them to get new components of the moduli space. We have a kind of calculus which indexes these components by certain colorings of a pentagon, which is how we get this, uh, this number. So I, I've written approximately 40 here because we're still writing the paper and I want to make sure that we pin down exactly the right number, but what I want to emphasize here is that uh, there are lots and lots and lots of Poisson structures on P4, and the further we go up in dimension, the harder and harder this classification is going to get. Okay, so I hope I've given uh, some flavor of the geometry of Poisson structures on Fano varieties. Um, thank you very much for your attention to the mini course, and I look forward to discussing with those of you who can make it to the discussion session. Thanks.